In a nutshell, the premise is we take a variable speed angle grinder, we put a diamond bit in it, in this case one of those turbo ones, and we set it to a 45 degree angle to run along an edge and chamfer it. Important to note that it uses a siphon fed water bottle. And the goal, ideally, is to mimic this roundover profile with something close to it to avoid having to buy an expensive bit. And I'm doing that by making a chamfer that I will take the corners off of later. And so I'll tell you a couple things about cutting and polishing granite from what little about it that I know, but mostly this video will be about how you can make a nearly flawless chamfer at relatively low risk. First, a little stone cutting 101, because I haven't yet seen anybody put all of this information together in a nice little neat package quite so simply. There are pretty much only three options with a four and a half inch grinder for stone cutting. Think of them as small, medium, and large. These two up here are like bonus points. Common sense should tell you that the bigger the teeth, the more aggressive, and your common sense would be correct in this case. Without any teeth at all, you can make a really smooth, really risk-free cut in just about anything, right down to glass. But you gotta use it wet, and it goes a lot slower. This one, you can cut right through any material imaginable. It goes pretty quickly, and you don't need to use it wet. You can do it dry. Wear a dust mask. The compromise between the two is this one. Let's call these three types segmented, turbo, and continuous. These cups. Why is it called a cup? Well, I guess it loosely resembles one. These are more for surface grinding, and they're beyond the purview of this video. When I say surface, I mean flattening something irregular. These are more for cutting. Separate category. And since this is a 101 course, I should mention that we're talking about cutting granite, which is one of the hardest things you can cut. These things will all go through something softer, like marble or sandstone, or just about anything that you can imagine, like butter. To the grinder. Would we use this to chamfer? No. This is way too aggressive. Would we use this? Ah, uh, you could if you were doing glass. But granite is resilient enough that I noticed zero chip out with something like this. This is a good choice. And we're not knocking all that much material away. Note to tool designers, maybe put the arrow indicators where they don't get covered up. And Makita, if you're listening, this trigger is just awful. Spins this way, just like the arrows. Don't confuse what you're seeing with saw blade physics. Saw blades are sharp and they scoop, they cut. But in this case, we don't cut that way because it would cause chip out. Instead, think of it like petting a cat. You want the teeth to smoothly remove material. A saw blade cut is more like a wedge that separates the material. This is something different, it's more like grinding, so you can think of it as high-speed abrasion. There's a video about making one. If you want to match this paint color, start with a base coat of royal blue, and then finish it off with the fluorescent green. If you take your time, you'll match it. The jig. Start with a variable speed grinder. I know, I know you think you can just use it with a regular old grinder because they're more affordable and you probably have one or two of them already. But it's just too risky. Granite is expensive and you want to slow the speed down a little bit so that you're in better control. Okay, just a couple of big hose clamps. Attach it to a 2x4 that we're going to have to cut to the profile of your grinder. I know it's a pain, but 
it's not that big of a deal. Next, take, take a double chunk of two by four, cut it to 45 degrees, and mount it to the thing that mounts your grinder. Finally, you want to have five or six inches each way on this L-shaped deck. And then, I don't know, three and a half inches this way. Wouldn't hurt to have a little more, maybe four inches here. Come down on this fence, just, you know, three quarters of the thickness of your material, maybe. And then, as for the circle, we want to keep it nice and tight, especially to these corners. And the reason why is because when you're looking at it this way, look how it makes this little crescent moon sort of thing. And that will pull our water, and it's really nice because it makes a little reservoir of water right where it's cutting. And on this side too, because ideally you want both sides of this blade to touch. That way you can cut either this way or this way. Cutting involves putting pressure in the direction that you're going. Let's say we're going this way. I would keep this part of the deck flat. And I would just gently support with my other hand right underneath here, just so that it doesn't want to tip down like so. And then we just move forward in one very slow, gentle cut. Question, does it scratch? No, I lined mine with a plastic. You can get this at any home center. It's relatively cheap. It's a closet liner or a shelf liner or something. But that's not why it doesn't scratch. First, mist the place that you're going to cut down with water and then clean it with a nice soft towel. Then your deck shouldn't be scratchy at all. I won't do it now because I haven't cleaned it. But as long as your deck isn't scratchy to begin with, there shouldn't be any contamination getting onto it as you move the jig across the surface because it's all contained in this reservoir. The slurry will just drip away onto the floor and onto your pants. For this cut, I would be applying pressure to this side of my table until I get near the end. And then I would switch my hand over to this side and apply pressure as I run off the edge. And the reason for that is because I'm losing my foothold on this side once I get around the corner. It's only confusing at first and only for a second and then you'll get it intuitively. The one caveat is that when you're starting at the very beginning, your drip tube might not hit the corner. So it's a good idea to start by getting a whole bunch of water here first and then starting your cut. It's nice to go over all of this stuff while it's all fresh in my memory because I just did about at least a half a dozen of these chamfers and they all went perfectly. So this device is totally worth sharing. They do sell expensive router bit like things to do this, but why would you bother? This is just a little bit of tinkering. You'll save yourself a lot of money. Last part. I think this is the last part. The drip tube bottle, the siphon feed. You may have seen this in other videos. I use it on my wet saw too. It's, it's a really simple design that works for a lot of things. This, I don't know what it is, maybe eighth inch inside diameter or something like that. It's really small. It's about an eighth of an inch. This stuff is the right amount of water. Any more thicker tubing, it will flood you out and get annoying. Any less, you'll probably have problems getting it to flow correctly. One of these filled will do, oh, I don't know, something like this sink cutout size piece of granite. It'll do two edges before you have to refill it. So you can easily make a 25 and a half inch width cut before you have to fill it up again. For a longer edge like this, you'd probably have to stop halfway through and fill it up, which really isn't a big problem. The feed tube shoots right down into that cavity between the blade and the granite. And it's not a problem if it touches the blade, it will just wear itself a groove and that just makes a tighter fit. Screw it right to the side of your jig. You only need maybe two feet of hose. 
This is a 5 inch plastic paint bucket. Works great because you have to elevate a siphon. If it isn't higher than where you're going, it won't flow. How does the siphon bottle work? Let's take a look inside. From the saw, it goes all the way down to the very bottom of the bottle. At the bottom of the bottle, it's held straight by a drinking straw. That keeps it from doing one of these. And then there's a shorter tube that goes into the cap, and the shorter tube just stops an inch down in. And what that's for is to keep you from having to suck. Instead, you can just blow. Blow into this, and it introduces high pressure that forces the water out from the bottom, and the siphon begins. Really easy to work with. If I could change one thing about it, I would probably put one of those fuel line on off things here just to interrupt it because it would be nice to stop the flow quickly instead of having to fumble with unscrewing it. Minor complaint, but I do this enough that I probably should start to consider putting one on. Okay, sizing of the chamfer. This is probably not one of my better designed jigs. And I say that because it only has one function and it's very difficult to change, you know, to adjust to make it the size different. I really would love to have it get bigger or smaller, but this is like, it's a single use jig. Maybe you can come up with something better. In my case, I made top chamfers that are kind of large for right here because this is an inside corner this piece will mate to that and I'm trying to match this bullnose sort of thing this round over but I also made a smaller chamfer for right here which is an edge that goes against the stove and also down here where it goes against the refrigerator those are smaller so it would be nice to make multiple sizes how I managed to make the adjustment was by first setting the jig, building it such that it was the deeper of the two, and then I just used a shim in between these two parts in order to pull them, the sp you know, to make the spacing bigger and pull that up away from the granite. Editor's note. Ideally, it would be great to have a height adjustment, but since that's complicated to implement, shims will have to do for now. In hindsight, it might have been easier to instead shim it between the deck and the angle block. Doing so would also give you another opportunity to better square the two sides of the cutting surface against the granite slab. A quick point about setting the depth on this jig and also squaring it up. Rather than using one hose clamp that goes all the way around, if you put two on it, it will allow you to adjust the tension on either side. That way you can draw, by tightening one or the other, the blade in the direction of the tension. And here's how you can check that it's square. Just make sure the fence is in alignment with this ruler as it touches both sides of the blade. This will just be part of your initial setup. Shimming comes after the fact, if you need to do it at all but you can also adjust the height, that is, how much blade is digging in right here by loosening this and moving the entire grinder up or down. This whole thing is cumbersome to adjust, but that's DIY for you. Just think of all the money you'll save. If you can imagine a system that works better, I'd like to hear about it. At the moment, I have other things on my mind and I can't afford to invest the thought into improving it because I got this done and I need to move on. Okay, bonus tips about cutting granite. What's this blade type called again? Do you remember? Turbo. You can put one of these in a circular saw. This is a seven inch blade or seven and a quarter or something. And run it right through this and you can use your handy dandy drip ball bottle to you know attach it right to where the blade touches okay but there's something else i want to tell you about cutting marking it presents a problem because water and friction will just run just about anything off and it's really hard to see a mark 
The secret is this. It's vinyl tape. They use this in like schools to mark out, you know, sports events. Let's say you're playing dodgeball and you want to put a line in the middle of the floor. It's really tough stuff and it really bonds well. I think it's like eight bucks a roll, but you know what? It's better than buying a specialty paint marker. Then you can just use your Sharpie fine tip and trace a straight line and cut. This system really worked for me nicely. That line will still be there after you've cut and even, even after you grind right down to it. And it's super abrasion resistant. And so I just covered from here to here all the way to something like seven or eight or nine inches in and the entire surface was protected from my power saw. Some precautions are prudent because think about it. As tough as granite is, as hard as it is, it can still scratch itself. And for that reason, every time you reposition this chamfer jig, have a spray bottle of water and, you know, spray the underneath to make sure there isn't any debris stuck to it. There's probably still some there from me using it. Yeah, look at those little shiny crystals. Those will scratch something. So be careful about that. Okay, granite cutting. A few important things to note. Make sure that the deck of your saw that rides against the fence is square to the blade. Make sure your blade is sharp. In fact, you should probably just buy a new one considering that they're only about 20 bucks and granite is way more expensive than that. And finally, if you're mating two surfaces together like I am here, use a grinding stone to put a nice little chamfer. Just the most gentle round over on the top sharp edge. Later on, this can be filled in with epoxy and polished to make an invisible joint. Take a look for comparison. This is what I want to achieve, and this is what I have. Look up close, and then I'll show you how I'm going to get from here to there. The chamfer is just a 45 degree angle, but what I want is a round over, which is a portion of a circle. But it's not magic, it's just shop work. Take a look at how the router bit that they use, for lack of a better term, leaves a sharp line. And that's because they don't want to blend into the top surface, they'd have to polish more. This supposed roundover is already closer to a chamfer than we think. In woodworking, the problem is easy. We simply target the sharp corner with a plane or another cut. Once it's removed, we can just sand it down. Exact same idea applies here. It doesn't look perfect right now, but this isn't about polishing, it's about shaping. If we put in the time to polish it correctly, that's what it should look like. Okay, so that covers the theory, but what about practice? Well, this is what it's going to look like in reality. You're going to need a continuous rim blade, and you're going to have to take the guard off. Sorry to say it, but you can't do this with the guard in place because it requires four passes, two of which are going to be super low angles like this, and the guard will just interfere. It would be nice to have a continuous stream of water as we work, but for visibility reasons, we can't do that. We'll have to make a little bit of a sacrifice and just mist as we go. We'll mist it so it's wet, and then as we cut, the cut will reveal a sort of dry spot that just looks like an increasing white line. And that really lets us focus in like a laser on, on the material that we're removing. And so the job itself consists of four passes. On each of the two corners, top and bottom, you'll make a pass that's approximately half and half distributed on this and uh, this face here. Like, set, you know, just look for halfway through both faces. And then the second pass you'll make will be a little bit lower. The positioning is something like this. I don't know, it takes a little bit of experimentation. But the first thing that you have to do is just get over the whole fear thing. You aren't going to mess it up. I practiced on that whole piece over there. 
and I just slipped into flow really quickly. Uh, you'll understand it intuitively almost instantly if you have experience grinding. Any irregularities you make by not making a perfectly straight line with your grinder, you can knock down with one of these. More on this later. And now this, it's just a dollar store sharpening stone. Before moving on, I can choose to spend as much or as little time as I want with this. Just be sure not to roll up onto the part that you don't want to polish again. Honestly, you'll be amazed at how easy this is. You'll see your grinding marks. They'll start out as like white gills. And this just slowly erases them. In a matter of, my goodness, I have a minute and a half in, into this already. After five minutes with this, it would look beautiful. After which, I'll show you what it looks like, and then we'll move on to polishing. Just look for the white line and it will guide you. And look underneath for those gills. They slowly disappear. As it dries, it shows us all of its flaws, but that's a good thing. And it's looking pretty good. I still can give it a couple minutes, but while I'm waiting for it to dry, these grinding pucks are easy to make. Buy one of these dollar store stones and cut it in half with your continuous rim blade. Get it nice and wet and honestly it cuts like butter surprisingly. Diamond goes right through it. Okay, take a look at what we've got. And this is before any polishing whatsoever. That's a pretty good DIY approximation of a round over. And of course you're free to invest as much or as little time into it as you want. All right, this edge and this edge have both been chamfered and rounded over, and now they're ready for a polish. Granite polishing is no joke. This next part, even though it's two little edges, it'll take me a couple of hours. We're not sanding a block of wood here. Each of these pads goes on this hook and loop thing, starting at what they claim is 50 and going all the way up to 8,000. Once again, for control, you're going to need a variable speed grinder. Everything you grind will get a fuzzy white, and with each pad, you'll get progressively smaller and smaller scratches as you go. For the first five, six, seven pads, you can use them dry. And when you start to see scratches that you can't get out, that's how you know that it's time to switch pads. There's an art to it, but you'll learn. The second half of the pads should all be done wet, and I do mean wet. It's helpful if you have an assistant. The last step is to apply a wax, well, specifically a sealant. And that's right, I'm using a car wax. Now, of course, you're free to buy a granite enhancer, sealant, whatever you want, but this stuff will work just fine. Okay, these pads, they're made from old blue jeans, hook and loop fastener, again. This fabric is sticky, and sewn to it are about three layers of blue jean. And we're just going to use the wax exactly as you would any polishing compound. Don't wait for it to dry, we'll use it wet.
that's a pretty good job. I was able to preserve a little bit of that line. You can just barely feel it. Uh, the whole process was easier than you would think. If you would have showed this to me a week ago, I would have thought this was done professionally. So I'm pretty happy with it. The patience is really hard though, because the magic happens when you put the wax on. Now that the easy part is over, all that's left is to install it. Wish me luck. I hope this was useful to you. Okay, I think I've included all the clever tricks that I've learned along the way. At least that covers all the ones I wish somebody would have told me before I started. So, hope that helps you. But I have to get back to work if I have a lot of polishing to do if I ever want to get this installed. And this is an intimidating project. It's outside of my area of expertise. But I'm not afraid to sculpt something hard. It's not like I haven't done other things like this before. Just not, you know, an actual granite countertop. It just seems kind of beyond me. But it isn't. I'm not intimidated. And you shouldn't be either. Okay, I'll see you around. Maybe.